All right, thank you very much. We are going to talk today about evidence-based parvovirus treatment. First, as Dr. Levy said, I wanted to get a little bit of audience feedback. So this is kind of our chance to learn from our colleagues and hear what we're doing in the field. So we have a couple of questions for you guys. So the first question is, how do you currently treat parvovirus in your facility or out of your facility? Do you use inpatient hospitalization only, outpatient treatment only, a combination of both, or you do not currently treat parvovirus? Okay, so the counter didn't show up, but I'm not sure how many people responded. But so far, it looks like uh, we've got 25% of our group is using a combination, and then a majority of people are not able to currently treat parvovirus in your facility. Okay, so if you don't treat parvovirus, or maybe you might think about why someone else wouldn't treat parvovirus in their um, organization right now, what might be a reason for that? A, it's too expensive, you just don't have enough resources. Uh, B, it's too risky. Maybe you don't have the facilities that you would like to have for treatment. C, you expect a poor prognosis. Or D, maybe a combination of those above reasons. Okay, so about a quarter of the audience says it is still pretty expensive. Resources are limited to treat for parvovirus. You're spending those resources on other patients right now. About 50% said potentially that it's too risky to treat parvovirus. You don't have the space or the facilities that you would want to isolate those patients. And then a smaller proportion said that you expect a poor prognosis, and then maybe a combination of the above. So then if you are routinely treating parvovirus cases, we're curious what antibiotic you might be choosing right now. So we have a couple of different options here. A is ampicillin or moxicillin, B is Batril, C, Convenia, D, Cefazolin or Cefalexin, E is metronidazole, and F is a combination of, of any of those above antibiotics. Okay, so again, kind of a, a broad response range there. About a third of people, a little less than a third, are saying a penicillin, 13% using Batril, 7% using Convenia, 13% using Cefazolin or Cefalexin, small proportion using metronidazole, but the majority of people are saying a combination of some of those drugs. So what we're going to talk about for this short presentation is um, an abstract, actually, that was presented at ACVIM, the um, Internal Medicine Conference, in June of this year, this past year. And this was a, a study that was conducted at Colorado State University in their um, emergency critical care ward. And the title of their abstract is The Evaluation of an Outpatient Protocol and the Treatment of Canine Parvoviral Enteritis. So, Certainly, if we think back on our careers, many of us have taken parvo puppies home and treated them in our bathrooms, or we have staff that have wanted to really try hard to save these puppies, so we've tried to come up with protocols throughout the years that, that we could try to treat these dogs. Um, so I think we thought that this abstract was very exciting because it's, it's a way to get an evidence-based approach to what we're already trying to do for these dogs. So, you know, they certainly realized that many puppies that were presented to their university with parvovirus, these people didn't have the money to pay for vaccinations, so they also don't typically have the money to pay for gold standard inpatient hospitalization treatment. Uh, so their hypothesis for the study was that dogs could be successfully managed with an outpatient protocol that would get a similar outcome as their gold standard inpatient protocol. So the methods for this study, they had 40 um, individual naturally infected unvaccinated dogs that all um, were diagnosed with parvovirus based on a positive SNAP test. They divided them into two groups. So there were 20 dogs in each group. They had an inpatient and an outpatient group. At presentation, all of these dogs received an intravenous catheter and intravenous fluid resuscitation. So they uh, measured cardiovascular parameters and treated these dogs for shock. They um, did not stop the intravenous fluids until they were comfortable that the dogs were cardiovascularly stable. They also provided external warming initially to bring their body temperatures up. And they did an initial electrolyte and uh, blood glucose panel um, and treated for hypoglycemia initially. Then the dogs were separated into the inpatient and outpatient group. So the inpatient group received monitoring every six hours. They received enteral nutrition, um, meropotent or serenia every day. They received IV fluids and they received cefoxetin uh, injections every eight hours while they were hospitalized. The outpatient group um, received basically the same treatment. The only differences were that they received their fluids subcutaneously three times a day at a dose of 40 mils per kg, 
and then they received cefavicin or convenia injection one time on presentation. So the two difference, the only two differences in these treatment protocols were the fluid therapy route and the antibiotic choice. Now it's really important to realize, looking at this study, that even though the, the terms are used inpatient and outpatient, the outpatient group was kept in the hospital at Colorado State University. So they just weren't in a ho inpatient hospitalization treatment mode, but they were kept in the hospital. They were still monitored every six hours, just like the inpatient group would be. They still had blood drawn every day so that they could monitor these parameters very, very closely. It's a really controlled environment. They knew that the medications and the treatments were being administered appropriately so that they could feel really confident in their results. So even though it's called outpatient, these dogs were in the hospital. So uh, every six hours, the dogs received TPR, measured temperature, pulse, and respiration. And every 12 hours, they assessed hydration, their visceral pain score, and a nausea score. And they did have rescue protocols set up for these dogs if they felt that the visceral pain was um, high enough, then they would give buprenorphine injections. If uh, the nausea score was too high, which equated to um, more than three episodes of vomiting within six hours, they would give rescue um, anti-nausea treatment, which was um, Zofran. And then they also were checking um, electrolyte parameters every day. So they had rescue treatments for hypoglycemia and for hypokalemia. And in the outpatient group, those treatments that they would administer were Cairo syrup, just orally um, on the gum line for hypoglycemia. And then for hypokalemia, they were giving oral to with the with the feeding. And then both groups, inpatient and outpatient, were receiving um, syringe feedings of AD as their enteral feeding every six hours. So their results for the inpatient group, they had a 90% survival rate, so 18 of the 20 dogs. The duration of treatment was 4.2 days, and they uh, determined that treatment had ended at um, resolution of clinical signs and return of normal appetite. So that was when the puppies were discharged from the hospital. 85% of the inpatient group developed hypoglycemia, and 20% required uh, buprenorphine or rescue analgesia based on their uh, visceral pain scores that they were obtaining every 12 hours. And then in the outpatient group, the results were very similar. So they had an 80% survival rate with their outpatient protocol. The duration of treatment was very similar, 3.8 days. 75% of those dogs developed hypoglycemia and were treated for that and about 15% required rescue buprenorphine. And also to note, I believe they said that about 60% of the outpatient group required the rescue treatment for hypokalemia, the oral tumul K, based on those daily electrolyte parameters. So their um, conclusions from these results were that the overall outcome and the intermediate health measures all along the process were very similar. So again, they were taking blood work every day to be able to check electrolyte values, um, white blood cell counts, and there was no, ch no difference between these two groups throughout the duration of hospitalization in all of these parameters. So the duration of hospitalization was not significantly different. Their blood work values, the amount of weight change that they had while in hospital, or their caloric intake, none of those were different. Uh, their hydration status during hospitalization was very similar. And then throughout the process, the serial objective scoring that they were doing on the dogs was very similar. So the only difference in sort of the results for this, uh, these protocols that was significant is the cost. And so as we can imagine, inpatient hospitalization treatment at a teaching hospital for parvovirus costs about $3,000 on average. And their, um, their cost for the outpatient protocol that they had designed was only about $300. So their conclusions are that diligent supportive care and monitoring are still required to optimize success. So these dogs were receiving um, examinations by the veterinarian daily, still receiving oversight um, throughout the process. But they feel that their study definitely suggests that modified outpatient protocol can be a reasonable alternative when resources are limited. So this last question is, might you consider treatment of parvovirus using this outpatient protocol? And it asks, uh, A, yes, I'll give it a try. No, I think I'll stick to my methods. Uh, C is maybe, I'll check on the costs. D, not yet, still just not enough resources to treat. Or E is, I'm already using this protocol. Awesome. All right, then. Thanks, guys. So yeah, 77% said yes, you'll give it a try. Um, that's really exciting to hear. This, this is why we were very excited to see this protocol, because we felt like it was really applicable to our setting and shelters, um, and especially for even for foster home care treatment. 
So um, if you guys have any questions, um, we'll take questions at the end, but also feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to send you more documentation about their protocol um, and the contact information for the veterinarians at Colorado State. Thanks very much.